there's none of us who is looking at this program who does not have a relative who smokes. Maybe it's our father who smoked, who exposed the rest of the family to secondhand smoke. We have an increased incidence of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, but the person who smoke increased the risk factors for them developing bronchogenic cancer. The statistics bear it out that basically someone who smoked one pack of cigarettes for 20 years is guaranteed to develop bronchogenic cancer. But yet there are others who have smoked much less and developed the disease much earlier or diagnosed much earlier. And here again, it's not everything is equal. For instance, that person who probably was not as heavy a smoker was diagnosed with bronchogenic cancer because of a simple fact of where the tumor presented. So it's not necessarily related to the amount of cigarettes you smoke or some of us who have not been fortunate enough not to develop it. But knowing fully well that cigarette smoking has been incriminated in oropharyngeal cancers, in genitourinary cancers, and much more common in cancers involving the lung itself. And a lot of us may have seen this diagram in which we looking at the lungs, we have the trachea and the paratracheal lymph nodes, we have the bronchus, we have the bronchioles, we have the rest of the lung parenchyma. Here we have the lymph nodes that are enlarged from cancer that has spread into the carina. Here we have the tumor that presents itself. If this tumor were to grow and invade the bronchiole, definitely it would present with hemoptysis or blood within the sputum of that patient. And the diagnosis would be made much, much earlier as opposed to a person who presents with a tumor at the periphery of the lungs, which may grow to an enormous size because cavitatory lesions before that patient presents to the doctor. A lot of us looking at this diagram, us look at a chest x-ray, and all of us, or many of us, would have had a chest x-ray. If you look at, it, look at a chest x-ray and you find evidence of widening of the mediastinum, it says to us, let's look out to see whether or not this is either related to the ascending aorta or surrounding structures, which definitely are the trachea and the paratracheal nodes. Sometimes that is some of the common presenting factor of a patient. Then we move on to other studies that can help us to ascertain if this is actually a tumor in terms of the way it's presenting. You can either have that in terms of PET scan, CT scan, or an MRI. Those are just diagnostic methods. But just to go back to what we started and discussed was what are some of the factors that predispose us to developing of some cancers. We had mentioned exposure to naphthalene in bladder cancers in workers who were dealing with chemical in a chemical industry. It was where we found out that basically bladder tumors were much more common in that population. Recently, there's a widespread study among the very, um, with a very common drug by the name of Actos in which there is actually litigation based on a simple fact that it's actually been one of the causes of blood in the urine and extrapolating from that is it one of the causes of bladder tumors. But those are the things that we face with some of the common causes and you're trying to find in a, in a subject as varied as cancers what, is it, what are the relation between someone developing this and what is causing it and hopefully as the education of cancers continue because it's really still in the rudimentary stages that most physician and physician practices are faced with cancers per se as an entity in itself. We all know about the excitement that you get on the TV when someone actually finds the gene that is saying if, you, if someone has this genetic, it has this gene in their genotype, when you look at the DNA sequencing, that person has a high risk of developing, let's say, cystic fibrosis as a lung disease, then you're trying to screen the members of that family to prevent the early onset and try to treat it or try to do gene therapy based on a simple fact of knowing what is causing it. But in simple things that we know of in our community that we can correct, obviously stopping cigarette smoking will decrease the risk of bronchogenic cancer tremendously. Then we look at the environmental factors. Some of us say that we basically never heard 
of colorectal cancers before coming to the United States, cancers of the colon. Albeit a lot of studies that were done show that people who came from Asia, um, Africa, North and, and the Caribbean who are vegetarians have a very low risk of colorectal cancers. And that may very well be true because the increased amount of meat and red meat has caused the incidence of colorectal cancer. Here again, it is not a unifactorial cause that you can say eating meat causes colorectal cancer. But what has been found in those who have actually traversed the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans to come to the, the first world, to welcome to North America, have also changed their diets. And by changing your diet from vegetarian to increase meat, you have found that there is an increased incidence of this. But so also have we increased the amount of stress, we have also increased the amount of alcohol we drink, we have also increased the, the, the time we spend with ourselves, we lack exercise. So we cannot just say because we move from the Caribbean to North America and start eating red meat, that means we develop colorectal cancer. It added to the additive effect of our dietary habits, in addition our sedentary habits, or our, our lack of exercise, or imbibing of increased amount of alcohol, and increased stress based on the fact that we're in a very fast-paced moving society. Um, and that basically has helped to increase the incidence of some of these cancers. We also mentioned that some of the viral factors, so we mentioned things like genetic propensity, exposure to chemicals, exposure to smoking, exposure to a different environment from which we came. In addition to that, what are some of the viral factors? It has been known that cervical cancer, cancer of the cervix, we all know the anatomy of the uterus, the ovaries on the either side, the cervix which is the opening to the uterus, and then the vagina. Cervical cancer which can present in the early stages as a white, clear white discharge or post-menopause and um, post-coital bleeding, bleeding after sexual intercourse or even a little bit of pain during intercourse. And it's a very common form of cancer, much more common in a Jamaican population. And in fact one of the studies actually done showed that the incidence of cervical cancer as a female genital cancer was one out of every five of the cancer, genital urinary cancers presenting in a Jamaican population. Albeit the, the incrementing factors were multiple. It was supposed to be, and I'm not saying that this is because of the Jamaican population, I think it's if studies were done elsewhere in the Caribbean, we may come up with similar numbers. And some of the factors associated with, with it was multiple sexual partners, sexual habits at an uh, early age, but also the presence of human papillomavirus. And now we managed to isolate a vaccine in which it's recommended that children, that, we, that young women, as early as the age of 12 years, should be given the vaccine to prevent um, development of cervical cancer. So here again in which isolation of one of the causative factors, in this case, the human papilloma virus has actually been helpful. In the same population, penile cancers or cancer of the head of the penis has also been one of the more common cancers presenting in that population as well. In fact, amputation of the head of the penis for penile cancers in this population has also identified human papilloma virus as being one of the incriminating factors. Not as strong a direct relation with penile cancers as with cervical cancers. We also know that those are some of the immune factors that tend to affect us. And here again, it's with HIV. With human infection, um, with, um, with AIDS and uh, HIV, we found that so many more cancers are much, seem to be presenting at a much earlier age the cases of those presenting with skin cancers that are very unique and common to, to an HIV population. Also the younger generations of those HIV patients presenting with early lymphomas or cancer of the lymph nodes 
much more common. There are also some cancers of the gut presenting in, I, in HIV patients, which seems to be related to the, to the immune deficiency associated with HIV and caused by the HIV virus. In the advanced stages, as you go from your T-cell count decreasing, and then when your T-cell count decreases to that degree where you become AIDS, an AIDS-related syndrome, there are other diseases, other common cancers that are much more um, common in this particular population. So we have an idea that basically the, some of the pathogenesis of cancers. In the next discussion, we'll try and go into some of the principles of cancer diagnosis and staging. In our previous discussion, we alluded to some of the causes of cancer, i.e. the pathogenesis of cancer and some of the more common cancers. In this discussion, we'll try and allude to some of the principles of cancer diagnosis and staging. We all know very well how do we diagnose it. We diagnose something because we have an index of suspicion that when we see it, we need to start worrying what it is. The more common one that I see and probably the one that's much more easy for us as patients to identify is the lump in the breast. The most common cause of a lump in the breast is a benign tumor. Not cancer, but a benign tumor. Of which the most common is a fibroadenoma or fibrocystic disease. Fibroadenoma is like a breast mouse which moves under the skin. It can tend to be painful, especially at that time of the cycle, especially if it increases in size due to the retention of water and the hormonal changes associated with that young person who has got hormonal changes based on their menstrual cycle. Here again, it's not attached to this, uh, the underlying skin or the overlying skin or the underlying muscle, and there's no evidence of lymph node swelling. The other common cause is fibrocystic disease, which gives us a lumpy feeling in the breast itself. And obviously, if we look at the diagram, it will show us that basically the breast tissue with overlying the the muscle of the pectoralis major muscle and then we have the lactiferous ducts that make up the, the area what produces the milk for the lactating mother and that it goes through the lactiferous duct itself and the fat lobules around it. The most common cancer to occur in a, in a woman and remember breast cancer can also occur in males as well but obviously much more common in females. And the most common cancer that we find is ductal carcinoma, intraductal, infiltrating or invasive ductal carcinoma. And this accounts for 80% of breast cancers. But the principle of the cervical diagnosis and staging is for us to be able to pick up the tumor at a much earlier stage. And the way we do this is for the woman to understand if you have a family history of breast cancer, the chances of you having breast cancer is much higher. If you have high risk behavior that predispose you to breast cancer, i.e. dementia starting at an earlier age, sometimes being on a form of um, oral contraceptive pill, being a heavy smoker and alcoholic, um, and alcoholic, with that strong family history, you should be doing a daily breast examination. and uh, the, the principle of a breast examination has to be, especially for the pendulous breast, is to basically be able to feel or isolate one area of the breast as you try and fix one area and you might move the fingers towards that area and try and make sure that you can actually feel if there is a lump. I've gone through in several discussions how to examine the breast, but you can examine the breast in several positions obviously by looking Symmetric, most of the most paired organs in the body are asymmetric and this applies to the breast itself. You're in the mirror, you look at it, you see whether the breast itself has any um, tethering, if there's any change, skin changes, if there's any discoloration, if you actually see a lump. You can either put the hands on top of the head whilst you try and, and tense the muscles and you can see if there's any underlying tumor um, attaching to the skin or the overlying muscles. You put your hands on your hip where you isolate some of the muscles as well and you're able to look at it as well. And those are all from inspection standpoint. 
palpation is what your physician does for you or you can do it for yourself on a daily basis and you isolate different areas of the breast and you try and move around the breast as you isolate that. You also can squeeze the periareolar tissue around the nipple and to see if there's any evidence of a discharge. It's probably difficult for you to be able to examine the axilla or the supraclavicular nodes. You don't really want to be in a position to do that because once you start to find evidence of a spread to the axilla or the supraclavicular nodes, that is an advanced tumor. And here again we mentioned the principles of cancer diagnosis and staging. I want you to get familiar with the terms. You want to diagnose, let's say we choose breast cancer because it is, it is the one that makes us feel it's the most common form, um, second most common form of uh, cancers within the, the female population and it is the number two killer after lung cancer of women over the age of, between the ages of 35 and 54. But breast cancer is the most common form of cancer in women, second only to, um, and the second form is lung cancer. But in our population, it is so easy for us to start understanding how common breast cancer is and to start doing a daily examination because it is such a simple thing to examine. And anytime you feel that there is a lump, then you bring it to the attention of your physician. Now, how do you start to, to think about it? Well, I feel a lump. I feel a lump. It has become important for me at that stage that I should actually get my physician involved. I may know that most common form of a lump in the breast is a benign lump, but then there's also that risk it could be cancerous. Now, how do I make that differentiation? That's up to your physician. How does he now differentiate that between a benign to a malignant tumor? Obviously, the initial stages, and this is for you to understand, if it is cystic, meaning it's filled with fluid, you can aspirate it and send the fluid to the lab to see if it has cancer cells. You can get a breast sonogram, which is going to differentiate whether it's cystic or solid. If it is a solid mass, you want to find out, is it cancerous or non-cancerous? If it's a benign tumor and you biopsy it and you find that there's no evidence of cancer cells, then the treatment is either monitor, evaluate, or excision of that tumor. Excision of the tumor means you take out the tumor, and usually those tumors are between one to two to three centimeters. So you can just remove the tumor, sew back up the breast, take the, the sample to the lab, and make sure it's not cancerous. And then do a surveillance on it, maybe in a six months' time, and see if there is any recurrence of it. Usually, if it's a benign tumor, nothing will recur. In that case in which you've isolated, you've actually excised and taken it to the lab, and you find out that there's evidence of cancer, now you're faced with staging that cancer. Now, when you start to stage cancer, it is not simple to do, but it, it is a systematic approach. At stage one cancer, which is the earliest, you try and figure out if the cancer, just try and figure this out in terms of the tumor, the size of the tumor, if there's any node involvement. At the last time I mentioned the presence of spread of a tumor, to the axillary nodes itself, and the other form is metastasis. So your doctor will tell you of something called a TNM classification. That TNM classification says what is the tumor size at stage one, and this is be taking breast cancer as an example of the principles of cancer diagnosis and treatment. The diagnosis was made by biopsy. The staging was done to find out how big was this tumor. You remove the tumor. If it's less than two centimeters, it's stage one. With no node involvement, it makes it stage one and no metastases. Let's take it all across the spectrum to stage four, which is the one we do not want ever to have a relative present with. Because in a case like this, this obviously decreases your life expectancy to less than 20% five-year survival, meaning only 20% of patients diagnosed with a stage four breast cancer will be alive after 20 years. The prognosis for stage one is much higher, especially with hormonal manipulation, chemotherapy, and radiotherapy being available. In a stage four, the tumor is any size, less than two centimeters, but usually it's more than two centimeters, 
with a fungating mass. And this, a lot of times that I've seen stage four cancers present for the first time, the woman presents with a fungating mass coming out of the breast itself. Very ugly looking, sweeping, infected, and it's a hideous thing to see, much more so from the fact of a clinician, when you, we should have been in a position assisting our patients not to come up with us with such an advanced lesion. Because if the person did not know what it is, they should have even had access to healthcare to present to us at an earlier stage. If this was presented at an earlier stage, that person could have at least have another maybe five, 10 years of their life to spend with their family. And I think that's one of the concerns when you see this, it's not you blame the patient, you blame yourself and you blame our healthcare system that sometimes we prevent patients from having access to health care by making them feel that you need to come to us and pay before we can actually give you um, diagnosis and treatment. I hope the days when we can be doing that in our Richmond Hill community is far and gone, that a physician can see a patient and advise them what to do, even in the absence of them being able to pay for the services to be done. I hope with the health care that we'll be providing or the health fear that we'll be providing um, on a bi-weekly basis, a bi-monthly basis, we can be able to eradicate some of these patients who present with such an advanced disease process. And sometimes it's that patient who has recently come from the Caribbean and Guyana, Latin America, the poorer countries with advanced lesions who are afraid to access the hospital system because they're afraid of the immigration and immigration process and uh, afraid even to just present themselves at the hospital knowing fully well that anyone who actually has a disease process cannot be turned away from any medical institution. So I hope that we can educate you that you should not be presenting with stage four breast cancers. Try let us, let us at least be in a position where we are presenting with stage one. Stage two is that breast cancer, which is greater than two centimeters in size as it shows here, and it's spread to the axillary nodes and these are the axillary nodes that are being involved, but it has no evidence of metastasis, meaning it has not spread to involve the liver or the um, liver or the bones itself. Stage three is a tricky one in which the, the tumor is greater than five centimeter and is actually spread to involve the axillary nodes, but these nodes are now fixed. When the doctor does the examination, you will feel the swelling under the axilla, and you know that definitely you have a part of your staging process is going to be to do an axillary node sampling and find out if there's tumor that's spread to those. This is the principle of staging. You want to get the tumor, you want to find if the tumor is spread to the, to the neighboring lymph nodes and that gives us a worse prognosis and then the worse prognosis if it has spread beyond the region in which the localized region of the breast itself and has involved the liver or the bones itself. So those are some of the principles of cancer diagnosis and treatment. As we continue our discussion regarding the principles of cancer diagnosis, diagnosing, diagnosis and staging, and some of the decision making and communication that goes with, with cancer, we spent quite a bit of time going over how to diagnose breast cancer and how to stage it and how to find out what our prognosis is based on the studies that have been done so far. At the same time, some of us do have a unique stories to tell that basically we have relatives who've had breast cancer diagnosed um, 10, 15, 20 years ago and that person's still alive and well. And we've had similar stories to tell of relatives who have had breast cancer diagnosed and were not alive after three to four years. Here again, the most important information that I can give to you, based on my experience, is that the earlier the diagnosis is made, made in terms of the size of the tumor, make sure it has not spread to involve the lymph nodes or the distant metastases, is the most important prognosis that we have for, fa for favoring that patient. But there's also another, um, another part of this whole scenario, is that when you do the, the excision biopsy and you remove the lump, whether it be a lump from the breast or let's say for argument's sake, the prostate in the case of the males, 
Now we need to be able to send that to the lab and find out what kind of histopathologic diagnosis that we're faced with. As a general rule, a well-differentiated tumor, meaning the, cell, the cells themselves look like the cells that they originated from, has a better prognosis than a poorly differentiating tumor. Meaning the tumor cells itself, when you look at it under the microscope, looks a lot different from the original cells itself. Point in question, let's take prostate cancer, which I'm seeing larger numbers in my practice. But here again is the most common presenting complaint of a patient with prostate cancer is no symptoms at all. In fact, we do a random, we do every patient do a screening for prostate specific antigen to make sure, especially for those who have family relatives with prostate cancer. It's such a simple test to do, it's part of your blood test. The values are between 0 0.4 and 4 that are considered normal. In the case of elevated levels, it doesn't necessarily mean that this is prostate cancer. Because prostatitis, which is inflammation involving this little guy, this little guy, which is a prostate, we can identify that this is the urinary bladder. This is the doctor's deference that drains from the testicles, the semen into the into the posterior aspect of the of the bladder and the seminal vesicles in the back here that stores the semen. The prostate gland is this gland when we're young, the prostate gland is nice and smooth. As we get a little bit older, then it becomes irregular and start to present with urinary symptoms. The most common one is which hesitancy, difficulty passing urine, or we stand there trying to pass urine and it does not come out freely. Those are all signs and symptoms of prostatitis, even blood tin sputum, more commonly found with bladder, bladder calculi, bladder stones, and even prostatitis than for prostate cancer. And usually prostate cancer as it occurs is usually asymptomatic. I have however seen a patient who's presented with prostate cancer with metastases to the lumbar spine. And that's a stage four. There's no way that patient should have presented with bone pain to such excruciating bone pain. He should have been diagnosed much earlier. So our education, our part of this program is to make sure that we can educate our people to make sure that they understand some of the common presenting complaints that we see with some of the common disease processes that I have seen over the last 20 years in this neighborhood and basically things that I need to leave with you that these are things that are going to continue but if we have an education process we should be able to tell our patients even before what to expect as they get older for instance this blood test just asking your doctor to do a PSA level you're over the age of 45 for the diagnosis of prostate cancer is a very a very it's it's almost to be done similar to the way we do screening for sugar screening for cholesterol and it should be make sure the diagnosis should be quite easy looking again as we did for the females in terms of breast cancer is to look and see how we stage prostate cancer for instance we mentioned in the breast cancer, the tumor stage one was when the tumor size was less than two centimeters and it did not involve the axillary on the lymph or axillary loads and there was no spread to involving distant metastases. In the case of prostate cancer in the male, at stage one is the same thing. The tumor is confined to the prostate gland itself and no involvement to the nodes on distant metastases. But here again, doing a rectal examination is difficult to find this. Even sometimes getting an increased PSA level due to this is difficult. At stage two is when that cancer now can be felt on a digital rectal examination. But so insensitive is the tip of the finger that it's not easy for us to make the diagnosis. You can make the diagnosis and say that the, can the prostate is enlarged or the prostate, the prostate feels um, a little bit tender. Obviously, the differentiator between a tender prostate is a better prognosis because obviously it's probably more likely to be prostatitis and feeling a, a painless nodule, a painless lump in the prostate is a difficult proposition at best and I think probably more important for us is to have that PSA level or to have that high index of suspicion if you have a family history 
and try and go one step further and get a diagnostic test done, whether it be a prostate sonogram or a CAT scan done of the prostate to see whether or not there's evidence of abnormal swelling within the gland and being able to have a needle-guided biopsy to any area that you think looks suspicious. Here again, we hate to be presenting at a case where we have stage 4, where it has actually spread to involve the entire prostate and spread to involve the lymph nodes around the prostate itself and basically involving the lymph nodes to the blood itself. Here again, we have the classification, the TNM classification, to give us the staging as in breast cancer itself, but much more properly advanced in diagnosis of prostate cancer is to differentiate on a Gleason's pathological scoring system. And even up to last Saturday, I spent almost about 20 minutes trying to explain to a patient who I had seen a week earlier with a PSA level of 9 and uh, trying to make him brave to say that basically it doesn't necessarily have to be prostate cancer but high index of suspicion tells you that basically this was and uh, when he had the biopsy done it came back that he did have prostate cancer his classification was that of a Gleason's classification between 6 and 7 we always like it and this is not a luck of the draw this is basically the, the presentation of the staging obviously depends on an early diagnosis but when we get the Gleason's classification, we are hoping that it's going to be a well-differentiated tumor, which is much more responsive to the treatment that we have available. A poorly differentiated tumor has a higher number of Gleason's classification score and basically has a poorer prognosis. It also is a much more aggressive cancer. A high so anytime you actually talk to your doctor, you also make sure you understand that, doctor, what is the staging of the cancer of my mother or my father or my, my sibling? And also in addition to that, what kind, how is it? Is it a well-differentiated tumor? Because here again, it predicates what is the treatment going to be for that particular cancer. For instance, let's say this is a stage 4 cancer of the prostate. There's not much can be done here. You cannot do a radical prostatectomy and remove the prostate here. You have to do palliation because most of this cancer would have spread to the bone. You have to do radiation to the bone to decrease the pain. You have to start hospice care because more likely than not that patient has had the, di the diagnosis, had the cancer for a while, and that has spread to involve the bones. And that was painful, very, very painful existence. They are going to present with bladder tumors, spread to involve the sigmoid rectal junction, as I have a patient who presented with stage 4 cancer. And uh, lo and behold, we did a rectal examination. He did not have any spread to involve the rectum. However, there was no way you could have told you could have told that this was true because a digital exam cannot diagnose microscopic spread. In less than four to five months, he had advanced tumor spreading to the rectum, presenting with bright red blood. We expected that because it was stage four, and it's a contiguous spread from the rect from the from the prostate to involve the rectum. We can look at the proximity, the prostate that's here, the rectum is here. So we expect in a stage four process that the tumor would have spread. We also know the still tumor would have spread to involve the lymph nodes itself. In a case of the stage three, the one presenting complaint that I had from a patient was blood in the semen. It turned out that he had a stage three prostate cancer. And that we can see just by even the staging of a stage three. It involves the seminal vesicles. Seminal vesicles is where the semen is stored and basically that patient was right on target when he said I think I may have a cancer involving my prostate and he did have a stage 3 cancer. The lesson here to learn is that having presented to the doctor is for you to have that understanding that says not only do I have cancer and they say leave it like that. You want to first of all know how you can prevent it for the next relative or the sibling or the person who's asking you the question that you're not stuck within the framework of not knowing how do I prevent breast cancer I need to examine myself early how do I try and present at an earlier stage where I can now say but I feel that lump but that lump I think it's probably painless it most likely is painless I need probably a fibroadenoma but what I need to do 
is to present myself to my physician and say, Doctor, I need to get a sonogram done. Or in a case in which we're postmenopausal, I need a mammogram done now, not next week or the following week. I need to be scared if I feel that I can examine the rest of the breast and I can find evidence of more lumps that seem to be more sinister. What does it mean by being sinister? Is it attached to the underlying muscle or the overlying skin? Is it a periodic tethering? Is there a nipple discharge? In the case of prostate cancer, am I presenting with signs and symptoms of hesitancy? That's not for prostate cancer, but more likely benign prostatic hypertrophy. But my doctor just told me my PSA level was 12. I can guarantee you a PSA level of 12 is not consistent with prostatitis. You now need to be rapid and focused in terms of being screened and get those relatives involved as well, your first degree relatives, in terms of being screened for prostate cancer. In a case in which you're presenting with hematuria, as I had a patient who just told me that he, is present, he has hematuria, he has blood in the urine, and so does his young son. It turns out he was like 56 years of age and his son was a 24. When we did a sonogram of his kidney, he turned out to have renal cell carcinoma. It may not be that this is an inherited condition, but the most common cause of blood in the urine for that would have been either stone or if it's an inherited, if it's an inherited condition, is adult polycystic kidney disease. It turned out that the father had adult polycystic kidney disease and the gene for that is transferred to the child and the child did have polycystic kidney disease. But the father had, in addition, he also had renal cell cancer. So it's an index of suspicion. It's a try and put it together. Am I a person who has risk for cancer? Is the symptom that I am presenting with a sign of symptoms of how a cancer can present? And you do not have to be right about it. What you have to be is to have that index of suspicion. You have to be cognizant of the facts of what actually increases your risk factors for it. And what is it in my family history makes me wonder that this is much more likely to be a cancerous process than a benign process, as opposed to my aunt who lives next door who does not have the gene. I am that person who imbibes or eats a lot of meat, and now I have evidence of, um, of penciling of my stool. The caliber of my stool has changed. I'm starting to lose my appetite. Am I more likely to have a, bowel, a change in bowel habits? I need to think more of it. Can this be colon cancer unless proven otherwise? I am now 68, 60 years of age. I'm getting older. I've done a lot of smoking and a lot of drinking. I've had a lot of, I'm, I've not exercised a lot. I've got a, pre, I've got a predisposition for developing colorectal cancer because my father had colorectal cancers. So that's how we need to start thinking. The best friend we have at that stage is our physician to start thinking with us together. As if to say, doctor, I need to make sure that that blood in my rectum is not my hemorrhoids, it's not my perianal fissure, it's not my perianal hematoma, but I need to make sure, doctor, that that is coming from my colon, and I want to make sure that I do not have colon cancer. I will go on and describe for you how is it that colon cancer can present depending on where it is, because I've always heard the discussion my relative had colon cancer, and she was diagnosed so late that it was already spread. And now I am being diagnosed very early, and you're telling me my prognosis is that I could live a normal life expectancy. So we need to look at this in a little bit more. As we continue our discussion on cancers, and anecdotally describing how cancers present in different persons and different experiences, I sometimes get told by patients that a lot of the information in medicine doesn't seem to be correct because if a relative of mine, for instance, has diagnosed with colon cancer and they said this person probably had it for four or five years and that person is still alive, haven't had the surgery or the resection of the tumor and then there's someone else who's just been diagnosed and uh, Basically, that person's survival is much less. But here again, there's a difference of, uh, there's so many factors that affect the prognosis and the treatment and the long-term survival 
of that particular patient. And it's always important, none better reflects it in my experience than does colon cancers. And just think of the way it presents. If we look at the colon itself, this is a small bowel which usually does not have too much pathology except for inflammatory bowel diseases like the Crohn's disease, the uh, diverticulitis, the uh, um, some form of ulcerative colitis. It enters into the either cecal valve and then this is now the large intestine. This is your vermiform appendix. It becomes inflamed and all of us know when we have acute appendicitis. But this is a cecum. This is the ascending colon. This is a transverse colon. This is the descending colon. You have the sigmoid colon here, the small portion, and the rectum and the anus. Now, if a tumor, if a cancer were to present, or let's say for argument's sake, someone presents with blood in the stool, a bright red blood in the rectum. The most common cause of bright red blood in the rectum for all of us, for all age groups, is mainly hemorrhoids. Hemorrhoids are distension of the venous plexus that involves the rectal area. And if you pass hard stool or spicy food, it will bleed. You will have bright red blood dripping from that area. Or when you wipe, it appears on the, wipe, the, the toilet paper. You can also have a very painful condition caused, called perianal hematoma in which when you defecate, it's extremely painful. Perianal fissures can give pain and even bleeding when you're passing stool. So can also a cancer involving the rectal sigmoid junction. This is the rectum. Part of the rectum has the epithelium, the squamous epithelium. The other part of it has the adeno, um, the, ade the, the, the glands, the the, um, the, the glands that actually secrete the, the, the mucus, the mucus that goes with the rest of the colon. This is the most common area, the rectal sigmoid junction, for a cancer to occur. But it doesn't say that if when a cancer occurs, let's say the cecum, the cecum is a very expansible portion of the bowel. And a cancer or tumor can grow to a very large size. In fact, I had one patient when I was a resident who presented with a tumor the size of a grapefruit in the cecum before the diagnosis was made. And this person, this woman, never presented with any symptom until the tumor had grown so massively, had involved the entire lymph nodes that drained the large, um, the large bowel. And when she presented, it was a stage four. It was a cancer in which had spread to involve not only the cecum, but also infiltrated the walls of the cecum, spread to the adjacent lymph nodes, and had contiguous spread to the pelvic wall, and also to the uterosacral ligament. So that was an advanced case. In that case, that person probably had that tumor for probably four to five years prior to the diagnosis being made, without any symptoms at all, no rectal bleeding, etc. And that would have been the example that comes to you when the patient says, my relative had this tumor for four or five years and no one ever found out what it was. But it was up to the patient to present to the doctor with either feeling of, I'm feeling fatigue, weakness and tiredness, which is probably how a right-sided tumor is going to present after growing to such a large degree. It feeds on the body itself. It makes the person anemic you probably might be able to feel a mass, especially if it's grown over the size of an orange in terms of the abdomen, but definitely having a colonoscopy and traversing the entire colon, the rectum, the, the sigmoid colon, the ascend, descending colon, the transverse colon, and getting into this area up to the either cecal valve would have yielded a diagnosis if that patient had presented with anemia, which is how most likely they would probably present, is anemia, of unknown cause, meaning the, you have the patient who's feeling tired and fatigued because of the catabolic process that takes place with a tumor that size. In a case in which the patient presents with a tumor involving the transverse colon, the symptoms here can be varied. A lot of times if it's a constricting lesion, meaning one that's circumferential growth that prevents the passage of stool, 
that person can present with alternating diarrhea and constipation. Very simple to understand. If the stool cannot get past the constriction, then it's basically going to have constipation. And when you have the fluid and the buildup, then there's a breakthrough and you get a lot of um, diarrhea. In the case of the descending colon is when depending on the level where it, where it is, you will find that the patient will present with either bright red blood in the rectum or present with um, evidence of penciling of the stool. Penciling of the stool is when the caliber of the stool being passed is decreased because of a constricting lesion. The blood in the stool is obviously because of the fact of the hard stool um, grazing against the, the, the cancer can actually cause bleeding. But also so can the tumor as it invades the walls of the rectum also produce bleeding. Here again if it's a small tumor it might take a while before the symptoms are um, manifested. But here again our hope is that as we mentioned before if we, if we diagnose cancers at an earlier stage like in, for instance, we went through the staging of breast cancer and prostate cancer. Now we'll talk about staging of colonic cancers. Here again, it's the same thing. What is the size of it? Did it metastasize to involve the walls of the colon? Did it spread to the lymph nodes around the colon? Did it spread to any areas outside of the lymph nodes to, in, to involve the contiguous organs? And obviously we know what the contiguous organs in the, in the abdomen is. It's obviously we're dealing with the liver, the spleen, the kidneys, the retroperitoneal organs and the retroperitoneal wall. And also to that area involvement in the bladder, in the females, the uterus, ovaries, the cervix. And we want to make sure that when we're diagnosing our cancers, or we're actually using all the index of suspicion based on the fact that the patient is presented to the doctor with their symptoms. The doctor is using his experience to try and diagnose at an earlier stage. For instance, if we said in prostate cancer, let's get the PSA done. Let's do a digital rectal examination. If we cannot find anything and the patient PSA level is right, let's get an ultrasound done on the prostate. Let's get a CAT scan done. Let's get an MRI done. In the case of colon cancer, because it's a tube, it's easy to pass a colonoscope. I know in residency we used to be doing the sigmoidoscope which has got 25 centimeters from the anal verge. And, but we will be able to diagnose at least 65 to 75 of the tumors of the rectal sigmoid junction which is the most common area. But now we have the colonoscope, we're able to pass it all the way through into the allocecal valve and be able to diagnose those tumors which were difficult to diagnose before. Those are the ones in the ascending and the transverse colon. So basically, we need to be able to utilize all the medical, um, um, the new, the new that's in medicine, and be able to diagnose them earlier. If we're able to come up negative with a cat with, with a colonoscope, then we can actually be able to see if there's any CAT scan involvement. We get a CAT scan to see if there's any involvement involving the the lymph nodes around the around the major blood vessels in the pelvis and into the in the abdomen itself. We're also able to get direct vision um, guided by a biopsy on the direct vision of any lesion that looks suspicious. We're also able to look and see whether or not there are any polyps that we can biopsy. And whilst we're biopsying, we want to make sure there's any evidence that it does involve the, the walls of the, of, the, of the colon itself. So in terms of understanding tumors and understanding um, cancers in general, it is for us to be able to understand how they present and in, as I said before it's it's not that if we think cancer as being this uniform mass of information that tells us once we know what one cancer we know everything about the other cancer you can see that we've gone from a discussion involving breast cancer involving um, prostate cancer involving colon cancer and other forms of cancer which manifest themselves and these are just three common forms of cancer We've also gone through and described what are some of the pathogenesis involved in cancer formation, whether it be genetic, whether it be environmental, whether it be chemical exposure, viral exposure. So even at a very superficial level in terms of trying to describe cancers, um, 
we, f we find ourselves in a position that there's so many different factors that affect the, the diagnosis and the treatment that we need to have that index of suspicion that we as patients need to, be, need to have enough information as to what some of those common cancers are and isolate the particular body part that we have. Here comes the decision now. We've actually been able to say, well, our family has a risk of pancreatic cancer. I need to be aware of what are the symptoms of pancreatic cancer. My family has a high risk of prostate cancer. Let me know what are the common symptoms of prostate cancer. But I'm also having rectal, um, I'm having bowel symptoms that are different. Does that mean that I'm at risk for colorectal cancers? I need to find out what do I need to be able to tell my doctor so they can now, he or she can now start the investigatory work to say, yes, you are at risk, but your risk is low, or you may be at risk, or your risk is high, or I'm not quite sure, but here's what I'm going to be able to do to make sure that I can actually increase the chances of me finding out if you do. And in the event of me coming up negative, here is what I will do to keep a surveillance as to what is going on with you and how the relevance of it. Now I've made the diagnosis of you having a cancer. Let's say it was a prostate cancer or the colorectal cancer or the breast cancer. Now it's up to me to tell you what the staging of it is. And by that I meant, as I said before, the size of the tumor, whether it spread to the lymph nodes or whether it had distance metastases. In the histopathological diagnosis of it by sectioning it and taking it to the lab was to see whether it was well differentiated, which means it had a better prognosis to respond, or poorly differentiated, meaning it looks so much different from the cells from which it originated that you're saying to yourself the chances of it responding is going to be much less than it was well differentiated. So these are all the factors. Now comes the decision that the family has to make. Mom or dad has breast cancer, but mom has breast cancer, which is a stage three, that is now metastasized to involve the liver. What do we do? Or dad has prostate cancer, which is now stage one. It's restricted, so let's say stage two, it's restricted to the prostate. Or he has colorectal cancer, and they're telling him it involves, it's a stage 4, it involves the entire rectosigmoid junction. So what you need to have is a total resection and then a colectomy and then be able to see what other form of treatment is necessary. Here again comes a decision that comes only with an education. Let's say, let's say we have colon cancers that's up on the screen now. What would I do in the event of having a relative being diagnosed with a CECA cancer with no evidence of lymph node involvement? It will be a removal, a, co a partial colectomy, or even a hemicolectomy, removing of that lesion, removing of all the lymph nodes, and be in a position to do a CAT scan or sampling of the lymph nodes. In a case in which you present with advanced lesion involving the rectosigmoid junction, is it, does it make sense, even at this stage, to do a total colectomy or even removal of that lesion and possibly have um, one of these bags in which the patients are carrying around with the stool? Sometimes it makes more sense doing that by removing the entire tumor. But in a case where we are we at a stage 4, that tumor would have spread to involve the lymph nodes. That it doesn't matter what you do. The life expectancy of that patient has decreased dramatically. Nothing is more of a controversy at this stage than what is happening with breast cancer. And the importance here is to know that tumors less than the size of 2 centimeters or any breast lump should be removed. Whether or not the entire breast should be removed, it is up to the opinion of the surgeon and the relatives. Some patients opt removal of the lesion, removal of the lump, and then have radiation to remove microscopic metastasis, but then it's a regular surveillance of it. In the case of prostate cancer, in the young person under the age of 50 who has prostate cancer, when you decide to remove the prostate, do you do a total prostatectomy, removal of the entire prostate, and you will guarantee because of the involvement of the sacral plexus, you will get erectile dysfunction. Now, at that time when you're discussion, should you then be explaining to that young 40-year-old, 45-year-old, 50-year-old, 
telling that you'll get erectile dysfunction as a result of total prostatectomy. And then the patient will ask you, well, doctor, can we do radiation, radium implant? You will get, within the next two to three years after, you will get erectile dysfunction. The similar way as a total prostatectomy because of the radiation. At that time, the wife and husband should be involved in the decision making as to what will be the outcome of that patient. Your primary objective is to make sure we're getting rid of the cancer, whether it be by surgical means with total resection of the, of the prostate or by radiation in terms of killing the tumor cells or as in let's say breast cancer, do you do a radical uh, mastectomy, removing the entire breast and have removed the tumor as a result, do you remove or sampling your axillary nodes at the same time and see how many nodes are positive? If you are caught in a situation, there's so many different parameters that have to be evaluated. Is that person pre-menopausal, where the estrogen receptors are positive, will that person then respond to tamoxifen as a hormonal manip manipulation to decrease the risk of getting breast cancer. So the discussion of any cancer is not, here again, a unifactorial discussion of saying this is the protocol that has been implemented for all types of breast cancer because every person will be different. Every person will present differently. Every person will have different expectations. The same applies for the person with a prostate cancer. Lung cancers, when it presents at the same time, it also depends on the staging. It also depends on the differentiation of the cells. So when we actually sit down to discuss cancers in general or cancers in particular as it affect our loved ones, there is a lot of information that needs to be acquired. At the same time, it's a learning process. When I practiced in Richmond Hill, and I first came here 18 years ago from University of Miami as a professor of medicine, I was a little bit taken back by the seeming lack of knowledge that we had at that stage. I'm happy to report that I've seen an improvement in that knowledge. But what I've seen is the yearning of most of our people to learn more about their disease processes and to learn more about other disease processes that they've heard from from others. My aim, my goal, my hope is that we all continue to thrive for more knowledge as it relates to diseases that affect us, our loved ones, our relatives and even our friends. Because that disease process might be theirs today might be ours tomorrow. Given the information that we've tried to do over the last hour, I hope that some of this will put into perspective some of the lack of knowledge and the absence of information that you may have had. My hope is that we try and present these lectures to you with the hope that you can try and increase your medical information as much as we can. I'm always going to be willing to educate the patients I come into contact with in terms of some of these common diseases and the way it presents itself. I will also be happy to allay some of the fears and anxiety associated with a typical presentation of common disease processes and let you not worry when you do not need to worry. But at the same time, you having a high index of suspicion regarding your diseases and of those of relatives who are less educated will possibly be the best guidance that you can give them because it's in your household that the best education is done. We try the best to do in medical facilities as physicians, healthcare providers to provide an education but sometimes we fall short and I for one have fallen short in terms of giving that education. I'm hoping through this particular program that we'll be able to educate our, our patients and their relatives and the community at large. I also hope with the health fair that we'll be having through the auspices of New York University Hospital on the Sundays between the hours of 12 and 3 that we'll be able to reach those patients 
who probably have questions, issues regarding some common diseases. And hopefully we can be able to guide you in terms of how to access the healthcare system and also to be in a position where we can try and diagnose some of the common diseases that we have and probably be able to give you a little bit of a better education than you probably can get um, from your household. It is my hope that basically through the channels of this TV program that we can provide as much education over the years, God willing, to be a benefit to our community, our society, and our people at large. Thank you.